He's the one who sets us free. Before I preach, let's go to God together. Lord, the scripture this morning told us that you search us and you know us. You know us when we sit down. You know us before we are about to say something foolish. You even know us if the offhand occasion we might say something wise. Lord, we ask for you to constantly feed us constantly guide us. Lord, be in our path so we cannot avoid you in the days to come. Lord, I ask for forgiveness of the places where we've been sinful, we've been arrogant, we've been foolish, and we've been about ourselves. Lord, use your Son and use your Bible to teach us how to be closer to you. Lord, use the people in this church to shape us and mold us and point us closer towards you. Lord, we're thankful for a good Father and a strong King who's victorious on our behalf. Lord, I pray for those of us that are struggling in the week and in the day for you to be victorious in these tiny moments where we need you the most. In our anxiety, in our fear, in our lack of trust, Lord, give us the faith that we need for the challenges ahead. Lord, we ask for you to be our good God, and we thank you that all of your works are wonderful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I get my notes set, we have been doing a sermon series called Made for More. I have, I've preached eight sermons on this series, and I think Kyle's got one. So we've done nine messages about made, being made for more. We've been discussing what it means for God to have created us. Um, we've been looking at characters in the Bible that have shown us how God uses individuals in different ways. He uses our quirks, our oddities. Um, and today we're going to close the series Made for More. Um, we're getting ready to go into Lent, and we're going to be shifting our focus. And I just kind of want to say this really quick. If you've never participated in Lent, you've never given up something or brought in something during the month of Lent, maybe it's because you didn't quite understand what was happening. Has, have you ever went to a wedding or a big party? Usually you have to prepare. You, if you're going to get married, you have to get the, the wedding license, you have to get the, the, the dress, the location. You are making preparations weeks before the big day. In the church, as we prepare for Easter, we're preparing our heart for what Jesus did on Easter Day. And so we pick up little activities, maybe praying, maybe bringing food, maybe you have something that's specific to you and you don't want to share, and that's okay, but I encourage you, prepare for Easter. Uh, prepare for Easter, maybe it's 12 cans that you're going to be on the lookout for. Prepare for Easter like you would another big day in your life. Going back to our sermon series, I, I got a little off topic there. We've been doing this sermon series made for more, and like I said, I'm, we're going to close it today. And we are closing it not because there are no more examples in the Bible of how we are made for more. In fact, if we were to continue this sermon series, it would no longer be called Made for More. It would just be called the Bible. Because in the Bible, we are confronted with stories continuously of how God uses us, equips us, and makes us special. So I'm going to just go through some of the ones that we've talked about, and then we'll get into our new topic for today. One of the things that we talked about right off the bat was how you and I are created with a purpose. As in, God doesn't make useless things or unimportant or unloved things. But God creates things that he loves and he gives them a purpose in this life. The second thing we talked about was how you and I are created uniquely. We do not look very similar in this church. Some of us have bigger hands, some of us have small feet, some of us are tall, right? Right? Some of us are even left-handed in a right-handed world. You and I are created uniquely, and sometimes what you might consider a disadvantage in your uniqueness, God has been waiting to glorify him in that. We talked about how we are created to rise. Life may give you a bad hand. You might have done nothing to deserve what has come down upon you, but when you can give those problems over to God. God creates situations where you can rise out of depths of despair. We talked about the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. And in that story, we talked about how you and I are created for evil to be conquered by God's goodness. We are created for good in all things. Kyle preached about how we are created to be leaders. Leaders not just 
in our homes or in the church, but wherever God places us. And where are we leading people? To Jesus, to those nail-scarred hands. We can be a leader anywhere. We talked about how Moses shows us that God equips us even when we stutter, when we misstep. We talked about how God makes promises to Abraham and God has made promises to you and I about a life that is secured in a future. I've enjoyed putting all these sermons together. It's been a lot of fun for me. And I've enjoyed it especially because as I write these sermons, it's a lot of study and a lot of time and devotion and, and it's good soul feeding time for me. But it's also a time where I get to interact with the Bible and the Bible helps me see myself as I read it. And let me say that again because this is the theme of the lesson for today. The Bible teaches you and I how to imagine ourselves. As we read the Bible, we now have a frame for how we look in the world, who we might be in the world. And so let me just start off. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself like that character Ehud from Judges? You are a left-handed man in a right-handed man's world, and yet God needs that uniqueness to accomplish his goodness. Do you see yourself like Hannah? You were handed nothing special, or nothing short of a terrible hand in life, and yet you brought it to God, and somehow God blessed you, even though there seemed like there was no other way. Do you see yourself like Abraham? Afraid to take steps into the world, afraid to leave home behind, afraid to try something new, but then in one moment you believe God and you take a step out in faith. The Bible helps us see ourselves. It shows us how we can be in the world. The Bible doesn't just show us great leaders. The Bible just doesn't point us, point us out as sinners and losers, but the Bible gives us an imagination for who we could be in the world. I have an, this idea that you and I are in constant need of being reaffirmed in who we are in this world. Because there's so many people, there's so many voices shouting to us about who you are and, and who you are and who you are, right? Um, and let me just say this, people need reminding about who they are, not because we're dumb, not because we're foolish and, and we're silly, but because there are so many voices telling you who you are. For instance, who watched the Super Bowl? What is the Super Bowl? It's a, it's it's a two-hour or a four-hour-long movie about the things that you need in your life to be happy, interrupted by a football game, right? All those commercials are just saying, you would be so happy if you just had some Tostitos in your life, right? And you know it's not true, but when you go to the store, you think, would this make me happy just to have some Tostitos? Throughout the world, we're told different things, voices telling us what we need to be better. I was... Um, on vacation and I walked past a magazine rack at the grocery store and I think it was Vanity Fair and on it it had this article about how to be the best you and I just skimmed through it and I'll tell you what it said um, the ideal person is young rich thin powerful and smart the ideal human according to Vanity Fair is one that's rich thin, beautiful, and smart. In the Bible, that ideal human doesn't come across that way, does it? In the Bible, the ideal human is the one that has faith in God. The ideal human is the one that cares about their neighbor so much that they lose sleep and have to bring them a jacket when it's cold, right? Who forms Vanity Fair's idea about the ideal human? And who forms your idea about what it means to be an ideal human? The Psalms we just read from this morning, they tell you what it's like to be a human. God goes with you. God knows your thoughts. God actually put you together, and it says in there that God values you. Notice how the Bible can shape our image about who we are in the world. Notice how the Bible can kind of combat those voices. The Psalm never mentioned how thin you needed to be to be seen and known by God, did it? It never mentioned how rich you needed to be to get noticed by the angels when you were in trouble, did it? Not once. The Bible shapes our image about who we are, and the Bible doesn't just say things like, you are a sinner, you are the worst thing you've ever done, and you are greed, and you are disgusting. The Bible brings up sin, the Bible calls us to account for our sin, but then the Bible introduces us to this idea that we can be forgiven by Jesus from our sins. 
We need the Bible to understand ourselves, and we need the Bible to understand God. For instance, you and I are not God, and the Bible makes that very clear. You and I can pretend like we have a lot of control over the world, but ultimately we have no control. We just have the illusion of control, right? God holds it all together. God sends us and God brings us back. We're going to get into our scripture reading in a second. And there's a character in our scripture reading that's going to help me, helped me kind of see myself in scripture. And I challenge you as you read it, how do you see yourself in the scripture? How does this piece of scripture inform who you are in the world? It comes from Luke chapter 7, and it's a story where a Roman centurion takes center stage. It begins this way. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, who his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this, Jesus, because he loves our nation. He has built a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not, did not get, even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Listen to that again. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself, I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes, and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been, the, then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. I've called the sermon Seeing Ourselves because often it takes time to see yourself. Often you need to have some interaction, some bumping in, even with the Bible, to kind of find yourself in the Bible. And in this morning, I want us to use the Roman centurion to help us maybe judge ourselves, look at ourselves in the world and in the Bible. But before I do that, I really want to drive this point home about we need to be exposed to the Bible, exposed to the other, to see ourselves a little bit clearer. I know a lot of you are married. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, but when you get married, at least I can tell you this from my experience, in the early years of marriage, some of you try to think back to those, something happens. You learn about yourself. You learn that you're not that great. You learn that you thought you were really clean, but you, maybe you weren't as clean as you thought. Uh, maybe you realized you were a little bit sloppy, and, and you didn't, had no idea about that until your wife turns to you and says, Nathan, I cannot live in a world with this many dishes in the sink. But I thought I was a clean person. No, these dishes are out of control, Nathan. When you get married, you learn about yourself. You might have thought you, you, might have thought, um, you were an early riser, but then your partner wakes up earlier than you. You might have thought that you were forgiving, but then your partner shows you something about yourself. Sometimes when you get married, you can see the other side of yourself. But I want to tell you this morning, you don't have to be married to get a view of yourself. You need to read your Bible. Your Bible can give you a very good view about yourself. In our scripture re reading from Luke 7, we're confronted with a Roman that I want us to compare ourselves to for a second. I want us to look at this Roman and the first time I saw this Roman centurion, I thought, wow, my faith is weak. Wow, my faith is sloppy. This guy has so much faith. Uh, wow, this guy is humble. He knows who God is, and he knows who he is. So let's talk about the centurion for a second. The centurion who had faith, the centurion who sent for Jesus, and then when Jesus comes close to him, he sends somebody else saying, Jesus, stop. I am not worthy of your presence. You are God, and I, I am not God. Say the words, and he'll be healed. I trust that you are God. Just speak it. I have servants that I speak to, and they do what they will do. I trust fully that you are God. I don't even need to see you. 
from a far off distance, just say the word. Uh, we'll get into this in a second. The centurion believed that Jesus was God. I wish I was like the centurion all the time. I wish I had his rock solid faith in the face of trials and adversity. So who is a centurion or what is a centurion? A centurion is a Roman soldier. And if you remember from your Bible uh, studies, Romans were not kind to the Jewish people. Romans were the invaders. Romans forced the Jewish people to walk with them. They, they took, I think, 90% tax. And then centurions were the ones who said, you only gave 70, I need the other 20%. Come shake you down. They're a little bit bully-esque. Now, the centurion, let me say it another way, is like the sharp end of the Roman sword. They're a cruel, powerful force that dominate Israel for a long time. Later, Roman centurions will be the ones that execute Jesus, that put him on the cross and kill him. So Jesus has a number of reasons to not want to help this man. He doesn't look good for his campaign, for his ministry. This guy, you know, he's, he's part of the enemy's team even. But Jesus goes. Jesus goes because he sees something that needs done in the world. And I want you to notice something about the story also. Jesus um, approaches the centurion's house, but he never meets the centurion. He, he never meets the centurion. Instead, the centurion always sends somebody else to Jesus. They never have a face-to-face -face conversation. First, it's his Jewish friends, and then it's his other friends. And so, when, the, uh, when Jesus gets close to the centurion's house, after being sent for by the centurion, this, I'm sorry, the Roman stops him. The centurion sends some friends and tells Jesus, do not come to my house. Um, he recognizes that he is unworthy to host Jesus. And I'm not sure what happens here. The, the man sends for Jesus. Jesus comes by and he says, don't come any closer, please, right? Jesus is just doing what he asked. He's on his way to go heal. Maybe it's just now that this Roman realizes who he is and who Jesus is. Jesus is this Jewish peasant, and he's this Roman centurion. What does his job mean? That he oppresses people like Jesus, that he hurts people like Jesus. He knows who he is, and he knows who God is. And he thinks, I can't believe he's actually coming. Notice also in the story, the slave doesn't ask Jesus to be healed. It's his owner, right? There's something in that. Your prayers, when you bring something to God, you can bring something to God to pray for somebody else, and God will act on, on your behalf. If I pray for somebody like the Roman centurion prayed for his slave, this story tells us that God can act. God is faithful. Now, the Roman centurion has faith, and his faith saves his slave. Um, where do you see yourself in this story? Do you see yourself as the helpless slave waiting for somebody to rescue you? Do you see yourself as the centurion who has bold faith in asking great things from God? Do you see yourself as the people following Jesus? When Jesus says, this guy, your enemy, has more faith than any of you, imagine if Jesus came into this church and said, your enemy by name had way more faith than you. What if he came in here and said, those ISIS leaders had more faith than you. What Jesus does is confrontational. Because what he encounters is real faith. So where do you see yourself in the story? Do you imagine yourself with the faith of the Roman? The faith of the person who persecutes Jews for a living? I think it's interesting that the centurion stops Jesus before he gets to his house. Because we have lots of ideas about God. You and I, we view God as our kind, loving friend, which he is. But this Roman centurion views God as dangerous, scary a little bit. He reminds me of, has anybody ever read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? It's a, a series by C.S. Lewis, and in there C.S. Lewis personifies God as Absalom, this lion. And the lion is powerful and good and kind, but it's still a lion. It's got sharp teeth heavy claws. It can move its weight around. You don't mess with a lion. You don't antagonize and pull on a lion's tail and make fun of it because it can turn and move its weight around harshly. The centurion sees Jesus, this Jewish peasant, as a lion. 
He knows who he is, and he knows who God is. He fears God. He knows that they are not equal. And so he he says, I have enough faith that this lion, this peasant, this man, Jesus, can heal. Just say the words, God, and it'll be done. It's dazzling faith that Jesus sees. And as I try to imagine myself in the story, like I've been challenging you through the sermon, I imagine myself not as the centurion, but as one of those that are following Jesus. My worst enemy has more faith than me? Oh man, God. But I thought I had it together. This this person from the other side of the block knows more about you and exercises their faith more in you than me? But I thought I had it figured out. What do we learn from that? How does, what does that teach us? I think it teaches us that we cannot put God in a box and we cannot put our enemies in a box. As we choose to see ourselves walking with God and being made for more, we have to look at everybody else and see that the same God walks with them, loves them, worries about them, and hopes that they bend their knees and have faith in him like the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion's not special. He doesn't have any secret knowledge. The only thing he knows is that this Jewish guy is God, and he is not. How does he know that? Has he read the scriptures? Has he been in the synagogue? I don't know. But that's all it takes to know. Other things about this Roman centurion, what does he do for a living? Is he a rabbi? Does he spend his days studying scripture? I doubt he knows a single psalm. It's not about knowing everything. It's about having faith in a God. The Bible, Jesus tells us that his yoke, the burden that he places upon you, is easy. We don't have to be biblical scholars. We don't have to be rabbis or commit ourselves to be monks. The Bible shows us we can have faith. We can have a job that we don't get to glorify God in from nine to five, but we can have amazing faith still. We can be from a different group of people that barely knows the scripture. It doesn't matter. We can have faith that still amazes God. So I challenge you, as you look at the centurion, think about your faith. And if it's weak and if it's struggling, it's okay. That's a great place to start because you know where you can turn to increase your faith. You can find stories where maybe you can relate to that character and see how God shows up in their life. Like Ehud, like Moses, like Abraham, or King David. The Bible helps us see and imagine ourselves in the world. It shows us that God will save us. It shows us that God cares. After we did our scripture reading, Don pointed out how much he loved Psalm 139 because it affirms that you are not junk. No matter what Vanity Fair says, no matter matter what the commercials say about weight loss and hair treatment that you need and that whitening that has to happen so that way you can get the interview, it does not matter to God. Look in the scriptures. Find yourself, and you'll find God there too. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we have been given the gift of Scripture, something that can show us so clearly who you are, but also, God, that it can reveal even who we are and who we can become. Lord, we thank you that you don't care about where we work. You just care that we have faith. Be with us this week. Increase our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.